Cancer Care. I'm going to kick it off and welcome Brenda Farnham, Associate Vice President, Oncology Services. Thank you, Jenny. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for coming out to see us. We really appreciate it. Um, as Jenny said, I'm the Associate Vice President for Clinical Services at the Lafayette Family Cancer Institute. I've been with a hospital for 34 years now and the cancer program for about 17. And so I've had the great um, privilege of seeing it grow and evolve to be what it is today. Um, so at, as we all know, cancer directly and indirectly touches the lives or of everybody in our region. You know, it, we could say many in our region, but I think it, it touches everybody in our region. So at the Lafayette um, Family Cancer Institute at Northern Light Cancer Care, we see more than 50,000 patient visits a year. It's a lot of people. And that's just at the Lafayette Center alone. We also have patients that are seen at our member organizations, such as Northern Light Main Coast, Northern Light Blue Hill, Northern Light Mayo, and then through collaborative relationships with Millinocket and MDI hospitals. So over um, the last many, many, many years, I'll say, Lafayette has made significant changes and steps to bring the most advanced cancer care closer to home for our patients. To name a few of these steps that we've taken, we've recruited top tier specialists, we have created specialized programs and support services. We've expanded our clinical research program. We've added oncology navigation to reduce barriers and treatment to care for our patients. And we've invested in advanced technology. Our Dana-Farber Collaborative opens up more care options and innovative therapies for our patients while keeping our patients close to home. As you know, travel is expensive, it's hard, and it's, it's just very taxing. So the more we can do to keep patients at home, the better their outcomes are going to be. We have developed and co-managed a young adult clinic for our young adults with pediatric cancers. The care of these patients is optimized by the experience that's available within the Raish PV Haskell Children's Cancer and Treatment Center. And just for fun, I added that again, just see if I could get tongue tied by it. The Raish PV Hospital Children's Cancer and Treatment Center is one of only 10 pediatric oncology centers in New England, and it's located right there, Lafayette Family Cancer Institute in Brewer. So staying true to our mission, we continue to expand our care and programmatic development by working with our partners across the Northern Light System and across the, the state of Maine. Over the next year, we are looking to further develop our oncology service line to best meet the needs of our patients. And examples of that would be, you know, policy standardization, order standardization, pharmaceuticals, and the like. So Northern Light, Main Coast, and MDI hospitals currently share services through the Northern Light Health MMC Cancer Care at Lafayette. We are looking at strategically sound and sustainable ways to expand services to keep patients closer to home. As you can see, this is a common theme. The more we can do for patients to keep them at home, the better their outcomes will be. So in the future, we look forward to sharing some of our strategies and plans in upcoming meetings and in communications that will be sent out. So stay tuned because it's gonna be exciting. So on behalf of the patients we serve, Thank you for joining us tonight. Your support really makes a difference to our physicians and staff, but more importantly, your support makes a difference to our patients, to the children battling cancer, to bettering the chances of beating cancer for adults, and to families who cannot bear the thought of being far from home or unable to afford to travel to far places for treatment. So we're very grateful for your commitment to joining us tonight. And I would like to thank you for being you and for being here. So now I'd like to introduce Arthur Martinez, who is the chairman of the board for the Northeast Harbor Library and a member of the MDI Hospital Board. Welcome. Thank you. 
Hi, everybody. Uh, we are uh, very happy and honored to have Dr. William Bill Vestrucci with us tonight. Uh, Bill got his undergraduate uh, schooling at Cornell, uh, got a commission in the U.S. Navy on our ROTC scholarship, and thanks to the Navy, he completed his medical school training at Dartmouth. Uh, he then uh, did his internship at the Naval Medical Center in San Diego, and then followed eight years as a medical officer for the United States Navy, uh, which also included two deployments to the Persian Gulf region. Uh, after the Navy, he returned to complete his radiation oncology residency at Yale uh, Medicine in New Haven and moved to Maine uh, there, thereafter. Uh, he is married to Dr. Hannah Castrucci, an orthopedic physician specializing in bone tumor management. Together, they have four teenagers, a dog and two cats. Uh, the family enjoys hiking, biking, skiing, and swimming. Uh, swimming, I'm not so sure about, but uh, in these waters, but uh, that's why Maine has been an ideal home for the Castrucci family since 2009. So welcome, Dr. Castrucci. Well, thank you everybody for that introduction, for the three introductions, and for having me here on this beautiful day. Um, so uh, Jennifer and Brenda asked me if I could speak about what I do. I think a lot of people don't really know what it is that a radiation oncologist does. I don't think a lot of people know what oncologists do in general, other than we treat cancer. But um, I would say a lot of people in my family don't even know what I do. They think I think a lot of people think I read films for a living, but I don't know how to read films for a living. So, um, so I thought I would just kind of give you an idea what, what it is we do in radiation oncology and kind of drill down to what we're doing here in Maine at the current time. So thank you very much. So um, cancer in Maine. So cancer is a big problem in Maine. It's a big problem everywhere, but it's particularly a big issue here in the state of Maine. Um, Maine has the highest or one of the highest rates of cancer in the United States. Um, over 7,000 people per year are diagnosed, and over 3,000 people, unfortunately, pass away of cancer per year. Um, it happens to be the number one cause of death, and 25% or so of deaths are due to cancer. So, you know, why is it in particular in here in Maine? You know, all the usual reasons, people who smoke and dietary, things like that, but we also have some particular challenges. Um, there's probably, at least from the old days, not so much now, I suspect, but a lot of industrial toxicity, toxins are still in the water and in the air and such. Um, radon is a really big thing. Um, I know that radon, when we first moved here, our basement was full of radon. We, you know, the inspector found that and we immediately had to get that taken care of. So um, I think that probably contributes to a lot of it as well. So in terms of how we take care of cancer in general in the world, in the United States, it's usually a, a combination of medical oncology, like Dr. Chotkowitz here, surgical oncologists and radiation oncologists. And I'm also not, I didn't list pediatric oncologists, but they're a form of medical oncologists. Um, and you kind of think of it as sort of the Army, Navy, and Air Force of the cancer team. Um, it takes the whole team in order to help eradicate these things. Um, and we often do various combinations of treatment, surgery and radiation, surgery and chemotherapy, chemotherapy and radiation, et cetera. Um, but it's not just the oncologists. We can't do our jobs without a very large, wider group of people, such as pathologists, diagnostic radiologists, they're the folks who read the films, um, all the various medical specialists and the surgical specialists, palliative care, um, and we have an excellent palliative care program at our hospital, probably better than most places by far in the United States. Um, primary care physicians, nurses, physical therapy, social work, nutrition services, geneticists, mental health, and we have a very robust clinical trials program here. All right, so that comes to radiation. What it is, this is what I do. Um, so radiation therapy came about, very, the first patient was treated with radiation very, you know, we're, this is two or three years after, two, year, two months after the discovery of x-rays. 
So, I mean, basically somebody discovered x-rays and then somebody waved some x-rays in front of a tumor. I don't know if it worked the first time, but basically they started using x-rays long before I think chemotherapy ever came around. Um, and they had early successes and over in the early decades, it was primarily um, brachytherapy, which is where they in, insert forms, forms of radiation into the, the body, into the center of tumors. But then by the 1950s, the, the, um, the specialty really took off with the invention of what's called the linear accelerator. And that's sort of what we are still using today, or at least a variation of it. Um, and that's what this big machine is that's hovering around this patient here. Um, but basically, it's a way of generating very powerful, very focused beams of radiation that are directed at tumors from a variety of angles. And we can shape those beams in various ways in order to tailor it to the individual circumstance. Um, and the technology has just gotten better and better as the, you know, with every decade, there's always another leap in, in the technology as there has been with chemotherapy and has the, as there has been with surgical management. Um, yeah, and so, and right now, I, I don't know what the exact number is, but it's well over half. Some people say 75% of patients are touched by radiation oncology in some manner in their course of treatment for cancer. All right, so what do we use radiation for? So obviously when people think about cancer care, most people think, oh, we're trying to cure cancer, which is absolutely a very large part of what we do, but also a large, we're not always just trying to cure people. Uh, a lot of times people present and their cancer has already spread. Um, in which case, then we're just trying to keep people alive as long as possible and to maintain your, their quality of life as best we can or to get it back if it's suffered. So some people we see have bleeding or pain or uh, neurologic compromise, that sort of thing, breathing difficulty. And radiation is an excellent palliative form of, of, of treatment. We, with just a little bit of work, we can often relieve a lot of suffering. Oh, that's okay. Good. So a, a question I get oftentimes is how does this work? Um, there are entire academic disciplines dedicated to trying to figure out how radiation works, how chemotherapy works, how these various agents work. And so it's sort of beyond the scope of, of this lecture, I think, on going into all the details. But at the most basic level, when radiation energy enters the body, and it hits a tumor cell, it finds its way to the nucleus of the cell where the DNA resides. And it tends to break these little bonds that hold the double helix together. If you break enough of those bonds, then the, the DNA molecule can unzip. And then the cell just cannot do what it normally likes to do, which is grow uncontrolled. Um, and so over time, if you, if you damage the cells enough, if you damage the DNA enough, they will, those cells will start to die off. Um, and people ask, well, doesn't that damage the normal tissues? And it does in the same manner, but we're very lucky in that our normal tissues have the ability to repair that DNA damage to a much greater degree than the cancer cells do. So we take advantage of that differential ability of the cells to repair themselves. And um, over time, with a course of radiation, the cancer cells die off and the normal tissues take a hit as well. But in between doses and over time, the normal tissues generally re can recover. There is, there are, uh, there are limits to what, what normal tissues can take, however. And so, we have to be very careful in delivering radiation that we're not delivering too much. We don't want to exceed the normal tolerance of these tissues because then there's no coming back from that. So that's how it works. So our team here, here in Maine, and this is basically how most radiation oncology facilities work. Just so you know, at Eastern Maine Medical Center, we have we currently have four radiation oncologists, and in September we're going to be having a fifth join us. So we're expanding for the first time in about 15 years from four to five, um, just to see how that goes. Um, but we're the so we tend to be the face of the program, 
but we are just the face of the program. We can't do our job without really literally dozens of other people that we work with every day very closely. And um, although patients don't always see these folks, they are equally responsible for their for assisting them in their care. So for instance, we have a nurse practitioner um, who works with us, who helps take care of the patients from day to day when they have little things that come up. Uh, we have a, a, a large team of nurses that are specialized in, in treating and managing radiation patients. Um, a lot of people don't realize this, but we have a team of physicists who their whole job is to make sure that these treatments are delivered accurately and safely and to just maintain quality throughout the, the treatment course from the very beginning, middle and end. And um, they're our final check to make sure that we're not asking the machines to do something that, that the laws of physics don't permit. Um, dosimetrists, they're folks who work with us to help plan the radiation courses. Um, there's a lot that goes into actually delivering radiation and planning it. There's a lot of computers and there's a lot of people. And those are the dosimetrists who help us with that. Um, and of course, we can't do our job without the people who sit at the front desk and help direct patients around and prepare our charts. And um, uh, we have nurse navigators and they help coordinate between specialists and between practices and they help just make sure our patients get to where they need to get. Um, nuclear medicine, for instance, in our department, we also use an injectable form of radiation and we, we do that in conjunction with our nuclear medicine colleagues. All right, so nuclear, uh, so this is entitled Radiation Therapy Advances at Eastern Maine Medical Center over the years. So these advances parallel the advances throughout the United States and the world over the last several decades. Basically, well, this isn't entirely true, but from the top to the bottom, the technology gets a bit more and more sophisticated. Um, so the oldest form of radiation is basically just sort of just sort of like zapping a, a portion of the body and hoping it hits whatever we're hitting. And that's called two-dimensional radiotherapy. Three-dimensional takes into account three dimensions and we can zap things from different directions. Um, IMRT, uh, intensity modulated radiotherapy is simply a, an advanced form of 3D, three-dimensional that um, what we call modulates the energy of the beam as it's delivered in real time. And that that is considered the state of the art in the United States and the world as of the last 20 years or so. And um, Eastern Maine Medical Center was the first to pioneer IMRT in the state of Maine. Image guided radi radiation therapy is just a way of monitoring the treatment on a, on a, during the course of treatment. It's a way of making sure that at the exact moment we flip the beam on, the target is exactly where we want it to be. As opposed to before we used image guided radiation therapy, we just sort of just assume that it was still basically where it's always been, but things move, your heart moves, your lungs move, and tumors move a little bit because of the, the natural physiology of the body. Um, stereotactic radiotherapy, this is where we use very focused, very short courses of radiation with very large doses directed at, for instance, a brain tumor or a lung tumor or a tumor in the liver. Um, these, these courses are very powerful. They require a lot of technology behind them. And, and again, um, Eastern Maine Medical Center was the first to um, pioneer radio surgery in the state of Maine, as well as lung radio, stereotactic body radiotherapy. High dose rate brachytherapy is a, is, so I talked about how the initial forms of treatment was with something called brachytherapy, where we put radioactive sources into the body. Um, that was pioneered, I think in Paris, like 110 years ago or so. Um, we still do that. Um, but we use a, a form of radiation where, where we place catheters or uh, an instrument into the body, and then we place a very powerful radioactive source into those catheters. And we do it all in minutes rather than several days where people used to have these, in, or, or over several months where they had these implants. CT simulator is simply a way of, of um, planning radiation um, that's an, uh, most places have had CT simulators for 30 years now, but, um, and that's what we have. So more recent additions, I'm trying to just sort of think back what, you know, what have we started in the last few years besides radiosurgery and stuff about 15 years ago? 
Um, Zofigo is a form of um, radio, radio pharmaceutical agent, which is a, an injectable form of radiation that, that kind of hones in on tumor cells and, and, and gives radi delivers radiation at an extremely short distance to try to take down some of these tumor cells uh, within the body rather than with an external beam. Um, adaptive radiotherapy planning it simply means that rather than setting a course of treatment for several weeks and just letting it go, we monitor the, the size of a tumor over the course of treatment. And as it shrinks, we modify our treatment as it gets smaller and smaller. And that way we are able to focus the radiation as the treatment gets smaller and reduces side effects to normal tissues. A common theme in everything we do is we're trying to deliver more dose over time to the tumor, and we're trying to do it in a way that delivers less dose to normal tissues in order to spare people toxicity. And that's been the general direction of the field, as it is all cancer fields. That's exactly what medical oncology tries to do, and that's what surgical oncology tries to do as well. Um, space or is simply a so that's the technology for folks with prostate cancer, where we can inject this gel-like material between the prostate and the rectum. And it's just a nifty way of separating the rectum and, and allowing, basically keeping radiation away from the rectum. And, 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 and these small bits of, of technology improvements improve people's lives a lot. Um, six, the six-dimensional treatment couch, all that is is if you can picture the way we used to do things, people would lie on a couch, on a bed, uh, table, we call it a couch, and, and it could go this way, it might go up and down and this way a little bit, that's three dimensions. But now we have beds that do this and do this and, and can roll in various directions. So um, it's a way of us putting patients ex exactly into the position we want, taking into account that, you know, People are not machines, they're not rigid bodies. They, you know, they, they lie on the table one way or the other to, from days to day. So by adjusting the bed, we can make sure we're that much more precise with our delivery. Um, what we call optical surface guidance and positioning, this is a very brand new technology that we're still just sort of trialing, but we've recently installed. And it's basically a way of using um, optical, um, how do I do, how do I describe this? We're using light to determine the exact position of somebody's body surfaces. So, like, for instance, when we treat breast cancer, we want the breast to be in the exact same position every single day. And um, and by using this system, the the couch will automatically bring the person into that exact position every day to deliver. So we're delivering radiation that much more precisely. Um, I skipped, I forgot to put on here deep inspiration breath hold. That's simply a technology in order to avoid or reduce dose to the, uh, of radiation to the heart when treating, for instance, breast cancer. Um, and then just other things that go into all this. Um, after we get to the cancer center, you know, I don't think we talked about that, but Sarah's house has been a huge plus. It's not a medical technology, but it really makes a lot of difference to have the ability to house people who live far down east, um, just a couple miles down the road. And it's a lot easier for those folks to come for treatment every day because radiation courses can be long and kind of grueling if you're driving two hours each way every day. Okay, what don't we have? Some people are, oh, is there anything you can't do? There are always things you can't do. Something called intraoperative radiation, which is just like it sounds. Some There are some facilities that do surgery and and then um, as they're there, they bring in an x-ray machine and zap right there, zap a tumor in, you know, when, when somebody's wide open on the operating room table. So we don't do that. Um, proton therapy, people have probably heard of proton therapy. Um, and it has, it definitely has its uses, but it's, a, it's an extremely uh, expensive technology. My guess is we won't have it in Maine for a long time. The closest one is in Boston. And then um, beyond that, it's like New York and Philadelphia and such like that. So there are a few facilities that do proton therapy, but there are very few reasons to do proton therapy that you can't treat with other technologies. Um, total body radiation is just a, a form of radiation we use for skin cancers and various forms of lymphomas and such. Um, and in conjunction with like stem cell transplants and such that we don't do here. Um, and 
One thing that would be really cool to have, but we don't have is it's called an MRI simulator. I, I mentioned we have something called a, CAT, a CT simulator, a CAT scan, but um, one of the up and coming technologies is using an MRI, which can just see things differently from a CAT scan. It just adds some abilities that, that um, would be nice to have, but maybe we'll have that someday. All right. Um, and so I, I call this slide count our blessings because although I mentioned there are some things we don't have, we have almost everything. Um, so the most important thing is we have a very large team of professionals who all really know their stuff and really care about what they're doing. Um, we have nurses to help keep us all in line and help our patients out tremendously from day to day. We have a great safety program. Um, I have the highest level of confidence in our ability to deliver radiation safely. Um, uh, the hospital is very supportive in upgrading our technology when it needs to be upgraded and introducing new technologies like that Vision RT um, when they become available and when it looks like it's something that's really going to help our patients out. Um, yep. And we have the and the reason I moved here was because they built this beautiful new cancer center and. I still think of it as a beautiful new cancer center because uh, it's when you're a radiation oncologist, it's always work, nice to work above ground. So um, with windows and such. So um, we have, uh, you know, our cancer program helped run by Dr. Chagwitz here and others. Um, we have uh, we have multiple tumor boards. A tumor board is simply when you get all the cancer doctors, all the surgeons, the medical oncologists, the radiation oncologists, the pathologists, the radiologists, the nurses, et cetera, geneticists together in a room. And you talk about the more complicated cases that come up because we all know that there's a limit to what we can each solve on our own. And we put our heads together and try to come up with a comprehensive plan um, for, for as many patients as we can. Um, and we, we do this practically every morning. Um, and oftentimes these tumor boards are attended by specialists from um, other cancer centers, in particular Dana Farber. When you know, I just this morning was it this morning yesterday um, we did that uh, coordination across um, all oncology professionals. That's just what I was talking about. Um, we're very lucky in that we have almost every surgical specialist here. There are a couple that we don't have, for instance, gynecologic oncology, but we work really close with the with the group down in Portland. So um, uh, it's a very, Maine is a great state to practice medicine when it comes to cancer care, I think, um, at least when it comes to collegiality. We all get along, you know, if we, if, if we see a patient who lives close to someone else, we send them there and they do the same thing for us because it's the right thing to do for patients because we, all the cancer centers in the state are pretty darn good. Um, let's see. And our partnership with Dana Farber, Jackson Lab, and um, and with all the different Northern Line hospitals that are around, uh, and we in our clinical trials program, we have a really good clinical trials program. Um, you know, I mean, I, I don't know how large the staff is, but but um, they're constantly on the lookout for who might qualify for being a clinical trial, and those clinical trials are often offered here. And if they can't be offered here, then then we have access to the trials at Dana Farber and elsewhere. And often they can be administered here, even if they're through data farmer. All right, so um, current trends in radiation or just in cancer in general. So one thing about cancer care, everybody's always trying to get rid of each other. So like the, Catherine will tell you this. I mean, she's if I didn't exist, she'd be the happiest person in the world, but, but I'd come and work for you. But, but, um, but that's great for patients. It really is because it just means there are that many more options coming along down the pike um, to help people out. And so um, if you use just one thing, oftentimes the toxicity from that one thing can be a little overwhelming. So like for instance, I don't know, 40 years ago, everybody with lymphoma was probably treated with radiation. Worked great, but 20 or 30 years later, oftentimes there were issues. Um, and then chemotherapy came along, and over the years, chemotherapy has taken taken over a lot of those, and now radiation has a, a much smaller role just to kind of mop up what the chemotherapy maybe couldn't do all by itself. Um, so, so trends uh, 
substance and systemic therapy, such as chemotherapy, immunotherapy, biologic agents for radiation. Um, radiation on the same, at the same time is often now taking over for taking over some of the roles from surgery. A lot of lung cancers are taken care of with, with radiation, uh, like a five-day course of radiation rather than with having to open somebody up and take out their lung cancer. There's definitely still plenty of role for surgery, but sometimes we can play a role too all by ourselves. Novel combinations of radiation and systemic therapy. So this is sort of the, this is what a lot of these trials are all about is trying to figure out how to integrate all these great new technologies that are coming around, immunotherapy, biologic agents, et cetera. How do we integrate them with forms of treatment we've been using for decades? Um, increasing use of radiopharmaceutical agents. I talked about Zofigo, but there are plenty of others that are coming down that um, we don't quite have here yet, but I would not be surprised if we have them in the next year or two, but there are some barriers to getting them. Um, and I think I probably touched on this. So, so over time, our goal is to increase our precision in delivery of radiation and decrease normal tissue damage. Uh, in general, the courses of radiation are shorter now than they were five years ago, which are shorter than they were 10 years ago. Um, when I was training, the course of radiation for prostate cancer was uniformly nine weeks. Um, now we treat a lot of people in five or six weeks. And, um, and, it would, and there are places in the country that are experimenting with as short as one week. And so, but we're going to let other people sort that out first and let them work out the kinks before we, uh, that's how we do things. We don't, uh, we don't adopt the newest thing right away. We like to make sure that it's safe first before we wide, more widely adopt it. Um, radiation planning is more quick than it used to be. Slightly before I got into the field, they were doing everything with pen and paper and you know, practically slide rules and calculators and, and, and um, determining how to deliver radiation dose. But with computers getting more and more powerful and um, it's just so much faster than it used to be and it continues to get faster and faster. And all that means is a shorter period of time between me meeting a patient and us being able to treat that patient. Um, increasing attention to the effect, right. So as people live longer, and this is, a, this is true in all the oncology fields, as people live longer, we have to pay more attention to the effects that our treatment have on people five, 10, 15, 20, 30 years down the road, because um, we can't just ignore those things. That, those are very important to people. So um, increasing use in what we call oligometastatic disease. Oligometastatic is just a big fancy word for when somebody has stage four cancer, but they only have one or two spots of cancer, like you know, in a single, a single spot in a bone or a single spot in a lung or in a spine or something like that. Um, whereas five or 10 years ago, we would simply say you have stage four disease, your treatment is only gonna be, for instance, chemotherapy. Nowadays, it's increasingly common where we will treat with chemotherapy, but as well, we will be very aggressive in treating those one or two spots on the off chance that those are truly the one or two only spots. And if we can eradicate them, then we found that in conjunction with improving systemic therapy, such as immunotherapy and things, people can live a lot longer and without having symptoms of tumors if we can get rid of those few, few tumors with radiation. Um, what else? So we don't do this here. We do a lot of, we do a lot of radiation for benign conditions. Um, we won't get into all those, but, but there are other things that are coming down that show great promise most significantly cardiac arrhythmias. There are some, there are some real, there's really good work going on right now where they're treating people with arrhythmias that are not responding to medications, not responding to surgical management, ele uh, electrophysiology uh, treatment, where if you can zap a part of the heart in just the right way at just the right time, their arrhythmias will stop. So that would be great to have in the next five or 10 years, but it's going to take a lot of work. Um, osteoarthritis, there, there, there's a lot of work going on right now of treat, treating somebody's hand arthritis with just a really low dose of radiation over a couple of days, and their arthritis gets a lot better for a, short, for, for a long period of time. So we may branch into that soon. There are places in the country early on during the pandemic that were treating 
um, COVID-19 um, lung inflammation with radiation, and there was a lot of a lot of data. We did not do that. We didn't need to, but but we kind of were waiting to see how that all turned out. But with COVID kind of coming down, we probably won't be doing that. But there are places that are doing it. But it just shows that there are people thinking in clever ways to have other ways to use radiotherapy. Um, great use of advanced imaging. Catherine would tell you this. When we first trained, you know, we had plain films. We had some really cruddy CAT scans. MRI was new. PET scan was never even heard of back then. And now we can see everything. And, 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 and there, there continue to be advances in imaging. And those advances in imaging really help us to pinpoint what's out there. You know, we don't need to open people up and look around for where their lymphoma is anymore. Now we just do a PET scan and we can see. All right, so this is the future. So artificial intelligence, everything's all about artificial, right? It's gonna take over the world. But I hope I'll have my job in a year, but yeah, I don't know, maybe. Um, genomic analysis, so that's really big, right? So so this is this is kind of how, Jackson Lab comes into, into play and, and other types of uh, genomics programs. But basically, tumors are, are looked at at a molecular level, at a DNA level, and it really helps, for instance, the medical oncologists in particular, but there's a lot of promise in, in uh, personalizing cancer care with radiation using, these, using genomics as well. Um, and then just adapting radiation over a course of treatment to the person and to the tumor, as opposed to, again, where we used to just say, okay, for its lung cancer, that's 35 treatments, da, 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 da. Well, maybe in the future, some people will be 30 treatments, some people will be 40, it'll all depend on their specific genetic makeup, et cetera. Radio protective technologies, um, that's sort of like what I talked about, the space or rectal space or things like that, but there are also medications that are in the pipeline that are meant to try to protect normal tissues from radiation as it's being delivered. And also short courses of treatment, basically we're just instead, you know, we've gone prostate cancer from treating people over 44 sessions, over nine weeks to six weeks to five weeks, and they're getting down to like five treatments. And there are people who are going to be experimenting, no doubt, in treating people in one or two sessions in the future. So maybe 50 years from now, everyone will be treated in one or two sessions, but we're still got a long way. Other things that are coming down the road. So biologic image guided radiation therapy. So all that is, is um, there are there no doubt there will be in the near future medications that are injected into people that will in a way light up when exposed to radiation and it'll show us where tumor cells are in real time as we're delivering radiation. And it will allow us to basically Make sure the beam is directly on where the tumor is because we'll be able to see it light up in real life, uh, in real time on the treatment machine. Um, these all sound like really, you know, flash Gordon stuff to, my, to us. And, and it certainly would have been 20 years ago, but I can see this coming just based on reading our literature. You see how people are experimenting on this stuff with mice and things like that. Uh, hybrid radiation delivery. This is where um, we can, we're hoping that someday there are places that can deliver radiation using not only a CAT scan, that's what directs it now, but also MRI at the same time. But basically combining MRI and CAT scan imaging at the same time, just to get a more comprehensive view of what we're treating. And then this is just a bunch of alphabet soup of stuff that all sound really cool, grid, lattice, pulsar, flash. So basically all this is like flash, for instance, is a way of, of delivering an entire course of treatment like that in a flash. And there are experiments that seem to show that it's extremely effective and the normal tissues, that treatment is so quick that they somehow aren't damaged. So they're, they're in preliminary work with this. It's gonna be great if it actually pans out. Low dose radiotherapy and microbeam radiotherapy. Basically what they're doing is taking advantage of, right now we do a certain radiation dose. Let's just call it 200 centigrade is sort of a standard dose, okay? Um, we used to think that using lower radiation doses aren't very effective, but it turns out that if you use really low doses like 25 micro centigrade or something, there are weird effects on cancer cells that we've never appreciated before. And um, they're trying to take advantage of these weird effects. 
And um, maybe someday we'll be doing, you know, we're always talking about giving bigger and bigger doses, but it is possible that one direction our field will take is going much lower doses, again, in an effort to increase cure rates and reduce toxicity. All right, takeaways, an awful lot of written here. So I wrote it, cancer care done right requires a very large team of highly trained specialists, um, coordination uh, and collaboration across a, a number of specialists and experts, um, very expensive and complicated equipment um, with a lot of technology upgrades and maintenance, um, a highly supportive hospital environment, always looking to see what's coming down the pike so that we don't kind of get left behind. And so our patients are, have the best that's available. Um, all this takes a lot of money. And so that's always a challenge um, in this environment and all environments and community support. So folks like you coming to visit and such and just showing support and interest is very helpful. Um, it makes getting up in the morning easier when you know that people are interested in what I do as well. Um, and, uh, you know, another message is as, as the systemic therapy improves, you know, um, there have been a lot of uh, talk about the death knell of various specialists and stuff. And, you know, people have always, oh, with immunotherapy, you won't need radiation anymore. And to some extent, that's true. And that's great for some, you know, there are some things that you could do with chemotherapy and immunotherapy that we could never do before and has supplanted I get that word, right, uh, supplanted radiotherapy. But at the same time, as these treatments get better, there are also increasing reasons. For instance, oligometastatic disease, when there's, you know, when for whatever reason, there's a tumor that just, that is just not going away with these treatments, we can come in and just kind of get rid of it with radiation. And then it works great. It's a great combination of treatment. Um, you don't need to leave the state of Maine to get state-of-the-art treatment. Um, there are, I don't think I put that, anything we can't provide can be coordinated through our close partnership with Dana-Farber, which is true. And, and we do have the largest concentration right here at the cancer, at the Lafayette Cancer Center. Um, there, you know, the, the group in Portland is larger, but they're more widely distributed. And, um, and there are definitely advantages to have us all under one roof where we all bump into each other constantly and um, in support of our patients. Um, and this might be it. Oh, oh, there it is. Oh, yeah. Um, anyway, any, I, I, I'll take questions and thank you very much for having me here. And, and uh, it's, been, it's been a real pleasure. That photo is, I can't remember, remember the name of the, the comet, but the comet that came during the, the, uh, the early pandemic, uh, I, I spent a lot of nights outside learning how, astrophotography and uh, got ahead to do something, right? And uh, I think I took that from like near the bridge in Bucksport or something. I don't know where that was, but, but uh, that was just a great opportunity. I can't wait for something like that to happen again. Anyway, yes, sir. Tell us a little more about how your Dan Farber relationship works. Yeah. Patients get taken there. What do they think that's the work? Taken there, is that what you said? Any particulars. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, well, there are different forms, I suppose, and I don't want to get this wrong. So, Catherine, you jump in if I'm saying the incorrect thing. But, um, for instance, we use them as a research. We've got them on speed dial, right? And we all know we know them, and they know us. And so, because we all know each other really well, we know who to go go to if when we have some tricky situation. So, um, off, sometimes we'll see something that's just really odd or we've never seen this before and we and that actually happens you know a lot you know i mean i would say several times a month i'll see something that i've never seen before you know you look through the literature and you're like it, it's remarkable how many unique things are out there um but the odds are that the folks at dana farber have seen that maybe a little bit more because a lot of the odd situations or difficult situations get funneled to them and so, and also because when you go to Dana Farber, you're going to see somebody who does nothing but prostate cancer, nothing but lung cancer. They eat, drink, and sleep lung cancer, you know. And um, and if anybody's going to be up to date on the absolute latest and greatest, it's probably them because they're often the folks who direct a lot of the radio, uh, the clinical trials and 
are have access to a lot of this other, you know, the, this information before a few months or weeks before everyone else. So we use them as a resource. I have them, you know, I know all the on my radiation oncology colleagues down there in the various specialists. And so we'll do that. Um, oftentimes, though, we need to actually send people down there. And oftentimes people will tell, and I tell almost all my patients, like, look, you should, I want you to feel comfortable with what we're doing. And, you know, I don't, you know, I don't want your family getting mad at you because you didn't, you went to some guy in Bangor, you know, Thanksgiving dinner, they're all mad. Dad, why didn't you go to Boston? But I feel great about sending for people offering second opinions down at Dana-Farber or elsewhere, because almost always they come back and say, yeah, you know, they said just what you said. And, and they, and they also say, look, we have complete confidence in those folks up in, 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 in Brewer to do what we would, the same thing we would be doing. So, um, but there are some, there are a few, again, far less than 1% of the cases that I see, I need to send out. Like, I'll be like, look, this is something that needs to be treated with proton therapy. This is something that needs to be treated with an advanced form of brachytherapy that we simply can't give here. And in those situations, then I'll direct them down there. Um, and I don't know if Catherine wants to add something. I'll just say that the, the, the larger perspective on the Dana Barber collaborative is that uh, we have been vetted very thoroughly by Dana Barber, um, uh, you know, and so the quality of our program and pharmacy, uh, the way we take care of patients, uh, all our operational. Um, um, you know, processes in the cancer center uh, to make sure that we were in alignment with what Dan Farber expected from us uh, and to be a member, a, a collaborative member of their, their um, kind of group. Um, in addition to that, uh, in addition to being on speed dial with uh, from Dan Farber and working very closely with them, we have a network of uh, tumor boards that we uh, participate in on a weekly basis uh, with them, uh, and we share partner with them, uh, our research department, so, as to the alliance um, that we are doing on the annual collaboration factors. So it's a multi level um, participation. Um, and we're very fortunate to, to have that, of course, um, um, you know, uh, you're in Maine, but I think that really uh, we are delivering, uh, uh, you know, uh, very good care to our patients uh, that you would perceive just as well in, if you went to a bigger center, so. I have a comment. Uh, I was here at a talk several years ago when Dr. Ed Benz, the former director of Dana-Farber was president. And he made a statement that has stuck with me. He said that your mortality is directly linked to your zip code. And in our case, because we have the Lafayette Family Cancer Institute within our collective zip codes, that we have better chances of a positive outcome than many people who are surrounded by a community cancer center. He also pointed out that while Dana Farber certainly is the name and the face of the greatest, one of the greatest cancer institutions, um, they benefit greatly from this collaboration because what they don't have is of just the ordinary folks. You know, when you think of who is showing up at Dana Farber, it's those who have the obscure. That's why they're great with the obscure. And they have the affluent who have the means to, they, you know, often travel to a place like Dana Farber, not having access to something that's in their local community like the Lafayette Family Cancer Institute. And so I've never forgotten that statement. And I think it's such a great tribute to what all of you do within that building every day. And it's the other, it's the benefit of bringing people talented like you, Dr. Castrucci, who could chose, could have chosen to go anywhere. And yet you chose here. And I'm glad that it's given you the quality of life to take pictures of the stars and hike with your family and also provide us very high quality of care. Yeah, I don't think you can get that picture in Boston. <laughs> no. <laughs> yes, sir. Many people reading the media read stories of miracles that happen with immunotherapy and biological agents. Mm -hmm. At a higher level, at an epidemiological level, are outcomes getting better 
And if they are, how, how much and how fast are they getting better? Let me defer that one to Catherine, <laughs> because this is her area of expertise. I, I will give you an example for lung cancer, for example. Um, only three, four, five years ago, the life expectancy of a patient with stage four lung cancer was probably a year, okay, with standard chemotherapy alone. Um, and um, so, so, you know, with the advent of immunotherapy in the last few years, um, the, the, what we call the median survival, on average, people live three years and a half. They have stage four lung cancer. And I have patients with stage four who have been following since seven years who would have died um, without immunotherapy. And immunotherapy has been like the latest wave, if you will, of, of, of drugs that we use uh, for patients uh, with cancer. Um, it is the first time in the history of cancer that we have an uh, immunotherapy drug that was approved by the FDA, uh, which is agnostic for any tumor type. So you can use it in any tumor type as far as the patient has the marker for immunotherapy. Uh, so there has been very, there have been very impressive responses with immunotherapy. But there's also, unfortunately, a lot of patients who um, do not necessarily respond. Um, the underlying theme of oncology, like uh, Bill showed earlier, um, cancer is a genetic disease. It's, it's a disease of damaged DNA. DNA. And, and it can be a successive you know, damage over time where you get one hit, two hits, three hits, and eventually you get cancer, or you get metastases, or you get a worse tumor. And now we're kind of, you know, uh, uh, dissecting these, this, all these pathways and discovering um, all the, the pathways that we can modulate through targeted therapy, through immunotherapy, through uh, various, uh, and, and studying those mechanisms and finally understanding why a patient is resistant to radiation, for example or why a patient responds to this drug and not that one. Um, how, you know, if you have a specific mutation, can you target that specific tumor? And we are, we, we are using all this technology of artificial intelligence to look at large sets database of, of gene mutations and tumors um, where we can identify, you know, specific drugs for specific and, and uh, it's, you know, there are new targeted therapies that come out pretty much, you know, if not every month, I mean, every couple of months, there's an article in the New York Journal talking about the new targeted therapy. Whatever. So, um, and, and, you know, I have patients who all of a sudden you give them a targeted agent and, and, and they go into complete remission when they failed three, four lines of therapy. So, That's great. There's lots of problems <laughs> with all these treatments. And also, you know, the fact we collaborate with the Jackson Laboratory, uh, we, have, um, uh, we have a molecular tumor because now we need to understand we, the physicians, we, the people in frontline treated patients, we need to understand these pathways and we need people who are experts at, um, uh, you know, telling us, you know, we'll use rather this drug or that drug. And we have a molecular tumor board with Jackson Laboratory, you know, every, every uh, twice a month where we have international experts sitting around the table, including one of our, one of the panelists on the tumor board. Is an Australian still still an international our families, um, and we have so it's really remarkable that we're able to have that kind of talent, um, you know, at, at the cancer center, and, and you wouldn't expect to have the opinion of an expert in Australia 
sitting in back of the main, but you do. So what time do you have that tumor board? <laughs> we we have it at four o'clock in the afternoon, no. so for him it's already in the morning. That is quicker. We we have you know there there's you know the technology is as good as as of course the, the, the people that use it. So um you know we're very fortunate to have uh, an incredible group of <laughs> And I had fun working with them. Right? We have fun. Um, I keep saying to patients, we sound like a bad law firm. Chad Quartz and Pester So, yeah, that's pretty much All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. Time. One of the fun facts, Dr. Castrucci listed out a lot of modalities and a lot of people, but what he didn't mention was how many treatments they do annually, and they do over 17,000 treatments annually. So this core group is a busy, busy, busy group doing really, really great work. So thank you, and thank you for being here and sharing all that tonight. And thank you, audience, for coming and, and participating and supporting us and, and listening to us talk. Have a good night. Thank you.